Hello everyone, George Costandi here. Um, I see a bunch of folks just logging in now. We are going to start on the hour. So in two minutes, we will be starting. All right. Hello, everyone. This is uh, George Costandi, and uh, just want to welcome you all. Thank you so much for joining us today uh, in Origin and Causes' sixth annual national tour. Every year, we try to pick a theme that is relevant and based on what we're seeing in the field. And as the post-COVID world started moving and life getting back to normal, whatever normal is, equipment failures and component malfunctions became the focus of a lot of our investigations for, for various reasons. Last year's national tour, we focused on complex commercial claims because we saw a huge increase of such claims. As people worked from home and their commercial properties were left unmonitored for atypical lengths of time. The trend snowballed further into machinery, equipment, and component issues starting to really manifest in 2022 in a big way. While, the component, while a component may be small and the failure mechanism microscopic, the resulting damages are quite the opposite. Catastrophic losses totaling millions of dollars are not uncommon and all stemming from a single seemingly small failure. We're very excited to share some interesting case studies with you about equipment failures and component malfunctions that we've investigated. And we're really hoping that we're all gonna learn together today. Before we kick off the first presentation, I want to spend a minute giving you an overview of Origin and Causes services and background. So uh, we were established over 30 years ago we're the largest forensic engineering and fire investigation firm in Canada with 16 locations and over 40 forensic uh, experts. So as you can see the geo pins there on the map, you can see uh, all of our various offices, our big geographical, uh, graphical spread. Um, this helps us get on sites very quickly. Um, this helps us secure evidence very quickly and to provide reports back to you very quickly. We are seeing the more offices that we grow, the, the less travel time, the last, less travel expenses, and the faster reports become. Um, we, we take great pride in how fast we're able to get reports out to customers and how much we're able to save for them um, with those travel associated expenses. So we're very proud of that and the customers are really seeing that have a big effect. We also have um, various services across all major engineering disciplines, including fire and explosion investigation. We have HVAC and fuels experts, um, building code and fire code experts in canine investigations. We also have structural engineering, materials, product and equipment failures, chemical engineering, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, 
accident reconstruction, drone inspection services, forensic litigation services, and catastrophe, catastrophe response services. I just wanted to show you um, a great feature on our website that people really love to use every day. So if you go to origin-and-cause.com, on the top right corner, you're gonna see the submit new assignment red button. If you click on that, it's a very quick and easy way to send us um, new assignments and you could specify any details that you have and it's a guided uh, process that tells you precisely what information we need and what information to exclude. Um, so um, if, please feel free to send us new assignments or even if you click on contact us, that if you have any questions or inquiries, please uh, reach out to us and we're happy to assist you right away. All right, so we have our first presentation um, on the CCRL Regina refinery explosion. And before we jump into that, I just want to go through a couple of quick points with you first. We're gonna be hosting five sessions today, each running about 40 minutes. And we're gonna have a little bit of a buffer time and, and 15 minute uh, breaks in between the presentations. During the breaks, please keep the webinar window open so you don't have to sign in again. And if for whatever reason you need to sign out, you just click on the same link that you use to join us now and uh, it will be active. We're gonna be doing a live Q&A at the end of every session. So please feel free to submit questions via the text box under the uh, webinar screen. And uh, all of the questions will be addressed anonymously. So you click here and you input the questions. Uh, if you have any technical issues, please email us at webinar at origin-and-cause.com. And we're gonna be sending completion certificates uh, by email next week. All right, let's get started, guys. So um, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Ken Swan. Ken is the Vice President of Western Canada, as well as a uh, fire and explosion investigator. He has over 30 years of experience, including 10 years with the Office of the Fire Commissioners of Manitoba, 15 years with Origin and Cause, and prior experience with Winnipeg Police Service. He's conducted over 2,800 fire and explosion investigations, has participated in over 350 testing related uh, tests relating to fire investigation and fire and smoke migration. He's been accepted as an expert witness in criminal and civil courts and in arbitration hearings. So um, I will pass off the mic and the screen to Ken and he will get us started. Hey, good morning everybody from Winnipeg where it's two degrees and expected to snow any second. <laughs> I hope everybody is uh, kind of happy and healthy this morning and we'll uh, get on with that. So a little bit of preemptory here. Nothing here in this presentation is intended to blame uh, blame CCRL management or employees. CCRL is a consumer's cooperative refineries. This is just the background where this story happened. Um, another note is that almost all my photos are close-ups because of the nature of all the piping so being so close together uh, at this refinery, we weren't able to get any really good background shots that made any sense. Um, this happened in 2011, and I know some of you are saying, why are we doing something 11 years old? It's because it took uh, basically 10 years for this to wind through the litigation and subrogation examination process. So uh, while it was all conceivably before the courts, uh, I really couldn't talk about it. So a rather complex story. Uh, this is something that we could probably do in 250 or 400 slides, but we're going to do it in 25. Um, I spent months at the refinery working on this, uh, three weeks at a time, back and forth. And the last time that I heard numbers, uh, we were in damages, was, we're north of 220 million. I never did get the final count. but So on your screen right now, we're, we're looking at the uh, CCR refinery. It was opened in May uh, 1935. You can see it's kind of a small installation. Uh, probably kind of crude by today's standards. A little bit of history was between uh, May 1935 and uh, October 2011 when the incident happened. Uh, there were many upgrades and additions to the refinery. The place is basically always under construction with additions and new technology being added. 
the failure area that we're going to talk about was installed in 1961 and uh, they called it the MDU or middle distillate unifier kind of just the the tag they give to that uh, particular area so this uh, failure and resulting explosion following fire occurred on uh, October the 6th 2011 at uh, 206 p.m. in the afternoon and you'll notice that I put it as failure explosion and then fire because that's the uh, order in which things occurred and when you're dealing with explosions and fires, it's always important to figure out what you had first. Did you have a fire that then led to an explosion or an explosion that led to a fire? So in this case, we uh, we had failure, explosion, then fire. The uh, fire's major was, was extinguished by in-house fire crews supported by the Regina Fire Department. The uh, CCRL fire crews uh, know how to isolate equipment, they have uh, standby firefighting equipment, uh, monitors, heavy hose lines all over. They were able to uh, control this very quickly. Unfortunately, we had uh, 52 injuries, uh, several of them quite serious. Uh, fortunately, no fatalities. And the only reason that happened is because of staggered lunch breaks. At the time that this incident happened, there was a huge refit in addition being done to the plant. And there were so many contractors on the site that the in-house lunchroom couldn't handle everybody. So they staggered the lunchroom and uh, or rather lunch breaks. And the crew that was injured was only partway back to their workstations when the explosion occurred. Had they all been back at their workstations and up at elevation, we would have certainly had fatalities. So uh, we're, they were very lucky that uh, Nobody died as a result of this. However, uh, I will underline the fact that there were some very serious burns here. The uh, facility surveillance camera, uh, third party video and eyewitnesses uh, caught, caught it all. Everything, everything was seen as it happened and it was recorded. Um, there was a massive con concussion from the explosion and a fireball could be seen for miles. The, uh, the weather when it happened that day was uh, 22 and a half degrees Celsius and a warm for an October day. And there was a wind blowing from the Southeast, which uh, you know, amongst all the piping and things helped, helped to spread, uh, spread the problem, which I'll, I'll talk about here. So this is a photo of the uh, refinery, just to give you an idea of the complexity of it. I think most of you are fairly uh, conversant with what a uh, refinery looks like. I'll just want you to take note of the uh, yellow crane in the middle here. So we're going to see that uh, we're going to see that again. And I'm going to go to a video here. I just want to show this is the video of the actual explosion happening. Hey. Again, you can note the location of that yellow crane, just kind of gives you some uh, perspective here. I want you to watch the crane carefully and oh, you watch the lower right. left. I don't, I don't think the video is playing. Watch the, you know, I haven't hit it yet. Oh. Uh, lower okay. left area of the screen here. Okay, there's the explosion. The crane actually is vibrating terribly. The bottom center, you can see people scattering from the, the area of the explosion. And the crane on the right-hand side here, well, he's, uh, he's still swinging around from the concussion. You can see the massive exodus of employees here up to, uh, to a safe area. pitch black smoke here, which is a uh, kind of evidence of a, a petroleum fire. Certainly it's a refinery, so it's a no brainer that we had a petroleum fire. Okay, we're back to the uh, still photo here. This is a uh, one taken by a contractor just in the days before the explosion. 
These are two screen grabs uh, from that video. The left hand here showing you business as usual. Everything is uh, is good. And this is the right hand side of showing you the, uh, the opening seconds of this massive explosion. The yellow crane, which is in the center here, is vibrating so badly you can't even pick up the color of it anymore. The overpressure from this explosion was substantial enough to cause the boom in this crane, which was 131 feet away from the actual explosion. Uh, it caused it to sway. It also ejected the operator from the crane and threw him about 15 feet from the crane. Uh, fortunately, he was uh, shaken up, but he was not uh, he was not badly injured. And I mentioned the word overpressure. Whenever you have an explosion, it's the overpressure that typically causes all of our damage, right? The uh, conflagration of the fire and all the pressure from the explosion is moving away from the epicenter of the explosion, and it tends to distort things as it travels. So back to some background here. Uh, we were talking about this being the middle distillate unifier, number 567. Uh, just look, that's the, the tag they gave this particular pipeline. It was an operation at the time of the explosion producing winter diesel fuel. The line that exploded or failed that contained uh, various mixtures of petroleum, hydrogen sulfide, <coughs> excuse me, hydrogen sulfide, hydrogen, and a multitude of other chemicals and corrosives. The corrosives will come back into the story here. This uh, MDU line ran along the east exterior wall of the compressor building. Compressor building was a uh, brick structure because the, the compressors were run by natural gas inside, the building was always hot, so staff always kept the windows open, uh, trying to let some of the heat out. The investigation team that uh, was assigned to this explosion were obviously myself, um, as well as uh, Dr. Chris Bueller. Uh, he was a PhD chemical engineer specializing in refineries, and uh, Dr. Kim Clark, he was a mechanical engineer uh, specializing in fluid dynamics. So the three of us were the only ones in there on behalf of insurance investigation. Uh, it was a good team, and these two guys were great to work with. Got to give credit where credit is due. Here's uh, two more photos of uh, the, the explosion in progress. This is caught by somebody with a camera on the uh, on the outside of the area. They were doing an interview or something, and they just happened to have their camera running, and they caught it. The left hand is a uh, distant view of it and the guy was smart enough to uh, zoom in very quickly here on the right hand side. You can just see the massive color of the flames and the height of it, get an idea of the uh, of the heat that we had. So the uh, primary failure and the explosions of subsequent fire all started in a pipe rack um, alongside the east side of this brick compressor building. Um, right alongside the open windows, uh, 16 feet above grade or above ground. Witnesses told us they heard a high-pitched whistling sound just prior to the massive fireball plume in the smoke. In fact, a lot of the witnesses turned their attention towards the high-pitched whistling sound to understand what it was, and then they're in a position to observe the, the actual explosion. Um, a number of subsequent explosions were heard. Some were actual and some were echoes as other pipes failed. The number of explosions that we had reported was highly dependent on the witness's vantage point. We know we had several. We had a couple of primary at the, at the point of origin. And then we had some uh, fish mouth failures, which I'll talk about in a minute, where uh, com other compressor line, other, sorry, other hydrogen lines failed. The, uh, the damage was very severe, but localized. The bricks on the outside of the compressor building were dislodged and pushed towards the interior. Uh, steel both inside the building and outside was melted, twisted, and the uh, metal and the aluminum melted in the pipe racks. Um, it was actually, a lot of the aluminum actually vaporized. We found it all over the ground. It was quite, quite something to see. Um, I'd mentioned fish mouth failures. 
Um, the, a lot of these were on hydrogen lines, which created the reports of multiple explosions. So an example here of a, a fish mount failure. And this type of failure is only caused by the application of external heat. So we had a look at a number of these. This one, here's another one. I think you can see why they're called fish malt failures. But we were able to exclude these because we had to have the primary heat from the explosion first in order for these to fail. So we were able to eliminate a number of these and uh, begin to hone in on our, uh, our problem area. The left-hand picture of the two um, is the exterior of the uh, compressor building. Again, you can see there's so much steel and pipe there, you can't really get a good uh, distant photo or show perspective, but you can see the uh, window is twisted and bent out of the building. The bricks, are, the bricks have been dislodged. And the right-hand side is the uh, internal ceiling area of the compressor building. You can see the uh, oxidation on the steel beams. You can see twisted steel beams. There was a massive overpressure and heat involved to uh, cause this kind of damage. The uh, left-hand picture is uh, the natural one of the two natural gas compressors. The right-hand uh, the right-hand picture shows a uh, a bolt. The explosion was so powerful and so massive, it sheared this bolt right off from the uh, concrete mounting. The natural gas compressor had evidence of an internal overpressure caused by the induction of an ex external flammable va vapor and air mixture. The blast was so significant, the blast plates were dislodged, oil leaked from the machine, the dipstick was ejected, heavy, heavy damage to this machine. The uh, natural gas lines in the compressor building were tested and were eliminated as uh, being any part of the cause. Miraculously, the uh, natural gas lines inside this building didn't sever. Um, and we were able to conclude that the flammable mixture did not originate in the compressor building. We were able to uh, eliminate the uh, natural gas lines on the compressor building as being a, a source or an origin for the uh, materials involved in the explosion. We then focused our attention on the area surrounding the compressor building and in an area where pipes were heavily damaged. Again, it was absolute severe damage, but quite localized. We were able to get up in the area with the use of new scaffolding. Um, we identified three hydrogen lines with evidence of direct flame and radiant heat contact. These were ruled out as being fish malt failures and determined to be secondary events. Then uh, discovered and turned our attention to a six inch pipe, part of the middle uh, distal unifier process that was found at the 16 foot elevation. It was found flapped open. It was uh, metal was torn like paper and the uh, severely damaged area was 16 inches in run length. Uh, and it was in a straight, an area of a straight run of pipe. There was no elbows involved. When you look top down at the damage, it, resembled the aircraft fuselage and wings, and uh, it was determined to be a, a, a catastrophic failure. Okay, there's a blue arrow on the line here showing the direction of flow. So the, the material was flowing from the pipe up top downwards. These two, this pipe here and this pipe here were welded together at this point right here where it's ripped and flapped. Okay, so this is a very, supposedly very hard carbon steel pipe and it's torn like paper. Why? Couple more views there. The left hand one is similar to what I just showed you. This kind of shows you the overall uh, layout of piping and scaffolding and uh, some of this was re-supported re post-explosion, so it wouldn't fail. It was a very difficult area to access. The right-hand picture shows you some details of where these areas were welded together. And uh, again, the metal is, is just torn like paper here. A 
we have to ask ourselves the question, why? Why did it happen in this particular area? And why was it torn like this? We know the product flow was from north to south and it failed at sonic velocity as determined by uh, a computer generated monitoring equipment that was present at the refinery. Now, the failure at sonic velocity explained the whistling sound that everybody heard. So you basically got the contents of the pipe suddenly leaving the pipe at the speed of sound. So yeah, there would be a whistling sound. The uh, all pipe on this run was designed to be schedule 80 carbon steel pipe with a thickness of 0.434 of an inch. You might want to remember that number because we're going to come back to it. Um, during preventative maintenance inspection, much of the piping in the plant or the, the refinery was x-rayed, especially uh, at elbows because that's where they typically have problems because there's a change of direction in the uh, effluent in there runs against the, the elbows and, and can cause uh, problems. They did preventative maintenance inspections less often in straight runs. And unfortunately, there was uh, no monitoring point where the failure wound up occurred, occurring. Hydrogen is easily ignited and became the chief suspect in our hypothesis as it singularly would produce this uh, explosion and fire well, Kind of think uh, like a hydrogen bomb. While examining the scene, and in particular the uh, six inch pipe flap, um, I was able to uh, hang upside down with a small point and shoot camera and uh, take a large number of un unfocused photographs of the failure site at almost a point blank range. <clears throat> Being as I was the only member of the team that wasn't a PhD, I was deemed expendable and allowed to hang upside down to get these photos. I actually couldn't really see what I was taking pictures of. I uh, just hung the camera down and blankly shot away, hoping for the best. Because that's as close as uh, we could get actually to the, uh, to the failure while it was installed. Later that day, while the investigation group was reviewing uh, all the photos of the day, we uh, made a pact that we would all review each other's photos as it was a, a team effort. Uh, Dr. Clark drew my attention to a photo and as being he was the expert in uh, fluid dynamics, he showed me that I, uh, I had a very lucky angle on a photo and it showed the, what he called a back step on the pipe joint. <clears throat> this indicated that two different sizes of pipes had been joined at the actual failure point. This is a little bit of an engineering diagram to show. So our direction of flow, and this here is from uh, is from right to left. What we found was the top pipe, or the, or the, the top was the top pipe in the photograph, and the this pipe here in the drawing was in fact Schedule 80, six inch carbon steel pipe with a nominal thickness of uh, 0.434, as things were supposed to be. The back step that Dr. Clark was able to identify was right here. And that's because somebody in 1961 welded Schedule 40 pipe, which is a thickness of uh, 0.237, roughly half the thickness, onto the Schedule 80 pipe. I know some maybe you're saying, well, how did that happen? They're different sizes. The difference with these pipes is the internal size. The, the outer diameter is exactly the same. So when they're joined together and they're welded, you can't tell. It's the inner wall that's thinner. Because the product flows in this direction from right to left on your screen, the back step caused turbulence right in this area and in this area, right? This material is designed to flow straight through here and it's not supposed to linger in any one area because it contains corrosives. So the pipe measurements uh, were roughly half on the Schedule 40 and the downstream side. Uh, I mentioned earlier they have the same outer diameter, so when you weld them together on the outside, you can't tell. The failed pipe was part of a heat exchanger unit and was designed to get warm. 
and was designed to give up some heat as part of the process. Uh, because it was designed to give up some heat, this identified a dew point issue where steam in the pipe was turning to uh, liquid water and allowing the contaminants within the water to, <clears throat> to etch the metal very readily. Uh, so this is called an ammonium bisulfate corrosion mechanism. This, uh, this was not the precise cause, but it largely uh, exacerbated the problem. The back step was the major problem. In simple terms, a single corrosive droplet would pass by the same point of the pipe in a turbulent swirl several times rather than just flowing by once. The uh, failed section was Schedule 40. It had been believed, believed to be Schedule 80 uh, all this time. However, the uh, Schedule 40 should have had a design life of 25 years in this application. Next question was, the time period was 1961 to 2011. That was 50 years. That was double its lifespan. And why did it fail when it did? So it was... 25 years late failing. So we did some interviews with uh, very senior operations staff and a retired staff member provided the answer. One very senior gentleman, and he was in his late eighties or 90, he had a near eidetic memory of this pipe run as his whole career had centered around this process area. This pipe was used for only a couple of months per year. Again, we said it was used for uh, making winter diesel. It was mothballed for several reasons, for internal production reasons. And again, only used occasionally per year to make winter diesel. When you added up his memory of when the pipe was used and shut down, et cetera, the use was just shy of 25 years. So while the pipe had been there for 50, it had only had material running by it for just under, uh, just under the 25 years. The, uh, the guy that we interviewed was absolutely marvelous. His memory was down to the month and almost a day of the year when, uh, when these processes went. Um, we also spent days searching through old service and upgrading records from the 60s, 70s, and 80s all in cardboard boxes. Um, and much of what we found in those boxes supported what the uh, senior uh, retired staff member was able to tell us, which was... Uh, great to have backup because it certainly confirmed that his memory was uh, uh, spot on. So this pipe had been corroded from the inside out, uh, partially by the ammonium, uh, ammonium bisulfite corrosion caused by the dew point uh, issue. The pipe is getting thinned all the time. Um, Primarily, the back step caused the turbulent swirling of corrosive products to pass by the same point many times. So you had this lingering of this corrosive product instead of just whistling by once, doing a slight amount of uh, corrosive damage. It lingered, it swirled, and uh, it etched away the metal. What happened is over time, this pipe was thinned. The metal was no longer thick enough to handle the pressure, and it ripped open. So as the product escapes at this uh, sonic uh, velocity, there's the whistling sound, which everyone heard. Everyone looked towards the whistling sound and saw the explosion. Um, products, primarily the hydrogen, coming out of a six inch pipe at, at the sonic speed in tremendous volumes. It entered the area and it entered the compressor house through the open windows and it was ignited by the natural gas-fired engines that powered the compressors, resulting in a massive explosion. Now, the massive initial explosion was followed by at least one more secondary and large explosion, and possibly more. But much of the uh, much of the explosions were heard. The, the flames and the smoke actually blocked some of the camera views to really get an accurate number. Um, but let's just go with, uh, we had at least two, two massive explosions now. 
Um, before I jump ahead here, I just want to note that we never discovered how or why a Schedule 40 pipe got into the mix. But certainly somebody wasn't paying attention in 1961, and that, that somebody was a, a, an, a contractor brought onto the site um, through investigation and paperwork. We uh, were able to determine which, who the contracting company was. However, they, uh, they no longer existed at the time that we did this uh, investigation and hadn't existed for a number of years. So we developed two ignition theories. Number one was the electrostatic buildup of product flowing out of the system, especially the hydrogen, could have been ignited right at the failure point. Or we had ignition by natural gas flame in, in the self compressor. There's two compressors. Uh, the uh, north compressor wasn't running at the time, only the self compression. Compressor, sorry. My conclusion that it was likely a combination of both leading to a catastrophic failure with multiple explosions. We absolutely had good evidence that an explosion occurred inside of the compressor as a result of it inducting the, uh, largely the hydrogen as well as the uh, petroleum and uh, setting off an explosion that began, uh, at least uh, one explosion began inside of the uh, compressor house. The electrostatic discharge makes sense, and it's possible that it was it happened also at the same time. It uh, it cannot be eliminated. Um, there's kind of two schools of thought here that it was one or the other, or possibly both. But this whole event happened in milliseconds, so in my view, either either one is possible. But we have solid evidence that the uh, that can that one of the explosions was caused by the compressor, and really we have a a fugitive gas that's very capable of uh, being ignited, and we have multiple uh, ignition sources present. So it was more about the failure rather than which ignition source uh, did this. So a few lessons that that we learned here that I, I kind of want to point out as being valuable. The, uh, the smallest details can be the most consequential to any investigation. Uh, we never want to overlook anything. Um, the fact that I was able to get that, and I call it a lucky photograph, uh, you know, of the uh, back step early on, gave us uh, really an avenue investigation to, to follow. Um, whether it's a photograph or a bent bolt or something on the ground, you find that an investigation, the smallest details can be very consequential. It may not mean a lot to you when you see them, but when you start to put all the pieces of the puzzle together, it can become very important. Uh, do not ever hesitate to collaborate with colleagues and peers and have them you review your work and vice versa. This is an agreement that uh, both Drs. Bueller and Clark and I made uh, day one um, at the investigation that this wasn't any sort of a competition where they're in a fact finding mission and uh, any theories, photos or, or you know, relevant paperwork that one of us discovered would, would be shared with the others. Um, and it was very highly successful. Um, I, I do find occasionally when you work with other people, especially people that you might want to think of as maybe a competitor. Um, if you, you know, if you're on the same scene working together, trying to be in a fact finding mission, um, Sharing sharing inter, uh, information and being uh, totally transparent with one on there is very, very helpful. That's how you get to the truth. And as well, witness information can be golden. The senior gentleman uh, just helped us explain so much of the timing. I mean, we needed to verify his accuracy, but witness information can be golden. Once you verify its accuracy and authenticity, uh, absolutely golden. And you know, in addition to everything else we learned, we had both uh, still photographs and videos um, of this. So once you put everything together, we had a, a very uh, a very good idea of what happened. Before I move on to questions, uh, just going to briefly deal with uh, various lawyers from insurance companies and, and whatnot sought to um, identify the contractor that worked in 1961. Uh, they were able to, but it appeared that the contractor opened up a company in Canada, kind of a shell corporation, in order to do the work. After the work was done, they uh, they closed up in Canada, and uh, 
we weren't really able to identify any, uh, or they weren't able to identify any uh, current parts of that company. Um, there were some efforts to the courts to try and get this company uh, reinvigorated and um, brought back as a, a company they could sue, but uh, that didn't uh, that didn't pan out. And uh, I think I'll flip it back to George now for any questions. Great, thank you very much, Ken. So we've got a few questions that have been submitted. Uh, folks, anyone that has questions can do so, can submit questions um, in the GoToWebinar console that's on the right side of your screen. If you look at the various kind of gray tabs, one of them says questions and you can input your questions there. Um, we'll get to as many of them as we can. Um, we are running slightly late, but we'll, we'll, we'll get to as many as we can in the next few minutes. So the first question that I have here is, what what ended up being the cost of this incident or the quantum? Are you the aware last, of that? Yeah, the last number I heard, it was north of 220 million. I, I believe it was quite a bit more when you factored in the workers' compensation and the injuries and whatnot, but... Uh, about 220 million or north of was the last time I, I heard an accurate number. Okay, okay. Next question um, I have here. Relying on the retired employee's interview, how strong is such evidence or information? If all you have was his testimony, would that be sufficient to render a technical opinion? Hmm. Good question. Um, you know, in this case, we had independent information to verify him. Um, he was very convincing and believable. I mean, whenever you talk to a witness, you have to judge their credibility. And this guy was very credible. In this case, even without um, outside verification, I would have believed him because it just made so much sense. Um, Everybody, everybody that you interview as a witness, you have to, uh, you have to analyze their credibility and, and their memory. Um, this guy was spot on, but it's always, it is always best to uh, get corroborating information, which we had in this case. So uh, I knew he was, uh, I knew he was accurate, but uh, yeah, you, you can't always just go on just a witness. It's always best to corroborate it because we have what we call honest but mistaken witnesses. That's could be that that could be the subject of a whole other webinar, but uh, it's always best if you can get some some kind of independent verification of what a witness is telling you. Great, thank you. Uh, next question: If I receive a refinery explosion, what do you recommend I do first to ensure a forensic firm has all they need at the onset? I mean, I imagine they they're all very different come in different forms. Um, but is there any quick pointers, Ken, that you could give? Yeah, you want to identify, you want to, uh, identify and notify your forensic firm as quickly as possible so they can get somebody on site and, and initially get in contact with the authorities at the site. The area has to be completely isolated, shut down. Um, any, uh, any pipes or compressors or anything that's connected to your failure area has to be isolated. Now, the plant would normally do that as, as part of their uh, procedures post-fire, but absolutely locking down the area and preventing anybody from tampering with anything, changing with anything, keep everything locked down so you know, all the records are accurate, uh, nobody moves anything. Pretty much the same as with any other fire explosion, we want to preserve the scene and uh, get it documented and get investigators in there as quickly as possible. Okay, great. Um, next question. Did you guys in your investigation find any other Schedule 40 pipe on site? Or was this just a unique kind of um, place? This was unique. Um, we didn't find any other Schedule 40 pipe in the area that we examined. Now, bearing in mind, we didn't tear apart the whole plant. Like I said, the damage was extremely severe, but in a localized area. So the piping that we looked at 
other than this one place was schedule 80 um, and really there is no good theory or explanation for why even schedule 40 pipe got in there um, other than somebody wasn't paying attention in 1961 um, how it got in there we're never going to know but it's the only piece that we identified of the sections we dealt with great thank you very much so we're going to um, stop here, have a quick break, and we will be starting back.